John Newton was born in London, July 24, 1725, the son of the commander of a merchant ship which sailed the Mediterranean. John had a devout Christian mother that taught him the Bible at an early age. Then when John was only seven, she became seriously ill and died. However, she had trained her son well in the scriptures and taught him the hymns of the church. She would often say to her young son, I am praying that someday you will become a minister of the Word of God. At age 11, John went to sea with his father. When his father retired, John continued to work as a common seaman, but left to his own devices, Newton fell deep into sin. Soon he was forced into the naval service. He became a midshipman, but when he attempted to desert, he was tied to the grating, flogged a dozen lashes, and was reduced to the rank of a common seaman. Following the disgrace and humiliation, Newton contemplated suicide. Eventually he recovered and later transferred to the slave ship Pegasus, carrying goods to Africa and trading them for slaves. Newton proved to be a continual problem for the crew of Pegasus. They left him in Africa, where he was given to an African duchess. He was abused and mistreated along with her other slaves. It was this period that Newton later remembered as a time so bad he was dependent on the slaves for food. Early in 1748, he was rescued by a sea captain who had been asked by Newton's father to search for him. However, knowing only a life at sea, Newton soon made his way back onto another trade ship. But he was so given to wickedness that he was soon despised by his own crew. At one point in drunken rage, he fell overboard into the sea. His crew's only attempt at rescue was to hurl a whaling harpoon at him. Striking him in the thigh, they hauled him on board like a speared fish. From that day till his death, Newton walked with a limp. On a homeward voyage at age 22, Newton awoke to a violent storm. His room began to flood with seawater and he rushed towards the deck. On his way, the captain stopped him and sent him to get a knife. The man who took his place on the deck was instantly washed overboard to his death. Newton was assigned to the pumps in an effort to keep the boat from sinking. He worked the pumps and then would take his shift at the helm. While he was attempting to steer the ship through the violent storm, he experienced what he was to refer to later as his great deliverance. One witness recorded, during the height of the storm, someone uttered an oath using the name of God. The sound of that holy name, even in an oath, struck home. Newton's thoughts turned to his godly mother who had so carefully taught him about God and God's word. As Newton continued to do his part in steadying and steering the ship, he prayed, O oh God, if thou wilt get me safely ashore, I will serve thee forever. He recorded in his journal that when all seemed lost and the ship would surely sink, he cried out, Lord, have mercy upon us. Later, when the storm abated, he reflected on what he had said and began to believe that God had saved him from the storm. For the rest of his life, he observed the anniversary of that very day as the day of his conversion, a day of humiliation in which he subjected his will to God's. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. He continued in the slave trade for a time after his conversion. However, he saw to it that the slaves under his care were treated humanely. It was not until later in life that he would strongly oppose the slave trade. In 1750, he married Mary Catlett, with whom he had been in love for many years. By 1755, he had given up seafaring forever. During his days as a sailor, he had begun to educate himself, teaching himself Latin, among other subjects. Soon he came to know George Whitfield, evangelistic preacher and pastor. During this period, Newton also met and came to admire John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement. Newton's self-education continued and he learned Greek and Hebrew. Newton decided to become a minister and applied for ordination. At first, his request was refused, but Newton persisted in his goal and was finally ordained. His church became so crowded during services that it had to be enlarged. In 1767, the poet William Cooper and Newton became friends. Cooper helped Newton with his religious services. They held not only a regular weekly church service, but also began a series of weekly prayer meetings for which their goal was to write a new hymn for each one. Newton wrote 280 hymns, the most well-known of them being Amazing Grace. There are two occasions upon which it is believed Newton wrote this hymn. 
Some believe he wrote it on the occasion of his beloved wife's funeral, while others believe it was written as a testimony of the great change God brought upon his life. In either case, what a powerful and beautiful monument to the glorious grace of God. After Mary's death in 1790, he published letters to a wife in which he expressed his grief and love. Plagued by ill health and failing eyesight, Newton died on December 21st, 1807. The epitaph on John Newton's gravestone says, John Newton, clerk or preacher, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the gospel which he had long labored to destroy. John Newton was instrumental in encouraging his friend and ally, William Wilberforce, to fight for the abolition of slavery in Parliament. Wilberforce was the major force in bringing about the end of the slave trade in Britain. Encouraged by Newton, Wilberforce fought for the abolition of the slave trade for almost 46 years facing mountains of opposition. Through it all, he faced this conflict with the same spirit that had led Newton. John Newton's life was filled with hurdles, strife, and adversity. But all of this only served to embolden Newton's faith and to cause him to rely more and more on the grace he had first received in the middle of a violent storm at sea, so that one day he could write the words to a hymn that would touch the lives of countless people around the world. Among Newton's contributions, which are still loved and sung today, are how sweet the name of Jesus sounds, and glorious things of thee are spoken, as well as amazing grace. Indeed, John Newton's life is the story of amazing grace.